generation. Found that half of the millennials survey would rather live in a socialist or communist country than in a constitutional free country as America. A large number of them, 22% favored the views of Karl Marx. 13% viewed Joseph Stone as a hero. It's a disturbing trend, and the fellows that, that, that brought it to the, to the forefront of that, uh, that survey, that study, and Doug Casey, I don't know much about him. However, I've seen other statistics as well. <clears throat> he makes the statement that about half of U.S. millennials would rather live in a socialist or communist country. It's primarily, obviously, of being millennials, the youth. Um, the fact is that the, the average 18-year-old that goes to college, he says, knows very little about how the world works. Has vague ideas he's picked up mostly from TV, movies, and the people who got a job teaching high school, uh, roughly nothing about economics, government, or history, is taught. In other words, the homes aren't teaching. The churches certainly are not. And he said that makes them easy prey for professors with totally bent views to indoctrinate them. They are no match for the professionals. Number one, the professionals, the professors have grade leverage over them. They have grade leverage, that means they have to answer. Or they get punished, sanctioned. The other issue is that they have the power of being professionals. These are young people in training. It's a high percentage of the kids that now favor socialism and now outright communism. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we see the disturbing trend. It's no longer here and there. It's more than a fad. The young generation hardening its heart, being implacable, being taught by media, being taught by everything but the Church of Christ and the Church, the families. For often the families, as was indicated in the survey, often they do not know what to say, how to respond to the charges that are made against the free society, and in particular America as the target. Our Lord and our God, judgment begins in the house of God. It is inside the church that you look first and foremost. And Father, we see the passage here in Ezekiel, we see in Luke 9, the issue of the blood being upon a person's head. For therein lies the nature of the curse, and from the curse, apostasy. The word's not used, not in today's churches. We go far and wide to find the, the term apostate, or apostasy as a movement, as a characteristic. O Lord and our God, we pray now thy blessing and ask that you would indeed bless us. For it is a blessing and a privilege to honor the name of the Son of God. To take his name upon our lips, for so, Lord, you deem it to be a blessing. We know that it is often unpleasant. Nonetheless, it is a charge before thy throne that we remain faithful testimony given to us in such a widespread testimony of thy word. O oh Lord and our God, the subject matter in which we preach, affected and afflicted the Apostle Paul, in fact, all the Apostles, affected and afflicted all the prophets, and brought our Lord, your Son, to his cross at the hands of both Jews and Gentiles, even as Paul. And now, Lord our God, we pray that we, being servants, not above our Master, must understand and testify in like manner. O oh, Lord and our God, we have nothing that merits the privilege of standing for your Son's name. It is costly. The day will come in heaven, and perhaps here a bit on earth, where outward pleasantries called blessings match our our, our estate and our profession. 
that both are one, but oftentimes they are not. So, Lord and our God, I pray that your mercy will be upon us as we take your word in hand. At such a time as this, the implacability of a generation turning their back on great blessings, turning their back on freedoms, the fruits of righteousness, so they understand not its roots. We ask you, Father, for your help, for it's been a long time coming. This is not a new phenomenon. It's built upon foundations long since laid by others. Now, Lord, our God, help us with this each day. For nothing can occur, as we've just described, unless the Church of Christ refused to be herself. It is true, Father. It is true that we are called to teach the nation, but please teach us how. You are long-suffering, and there's a framework for that. In Christ's name we pray, and we ask you for your mercy. Unread diet books on the shelf will not help a person to lose weight. Neither will a diet book that he reads while munching Fritos. Being dip, as one writer put it. So before we proceed any further, I'll warn you. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, verse 62. Lord, let me go and bury my dead, my father. Let the dead bury the dead, but come and follow me. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost? Whether he have sufficient to finish it, must happily it happen after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Luke 14. Be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, a mirror. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straight forward, he forgets what manner of man he was. In 1923, J. Gresham Machen wrote a book. He was a great he was a renowned Presbyterian, one of the great men of the faith in this country. Our generation doesn't know such heroes because our generation has adopted others. They've been replaced. J. Gresham Machen wrote the book Christianity and Liberalism in 1923. His thesis was simple. <clears throat> that theological liberalism was not another flip side of Christianity. It was a rival religion. Inside Protestantism and liberal Protestantism, you had two rival faiths. They are rival religions. They are not the same faith, just different perspectives. And he said that we, the Protestant Orthodox, give too much credit, not recognizing that they are a rival to the faith that Christ has called us to love and defend. They are, in fact, apostates. Theological apostates. That is not a word designed to be arrogant or judgmental. It is simply a fact that before God, their blood is on their own head, for they deny the Lord that bought them. You find that reference in Jude. You cannot serve two masters. And you cannot have the Bible being a critic of itself. You cannot leave the Bible in the hands of those who use it as a means of blocking righteousness in its claim. Else the Bible then is left with contradiction. And he says, unfortunately, we among the Orthodox love to have it so. We're fine as long as there is peace. Because there are too many very good people with whom we must differ. And we are not sparing in our adoration of their loveliness as men and good people as opposed to what, the, what doctrines they put forward and dissect the church leaving her damaged or even dead. The cost is too much for a people to bear. In the United States, a rival secular political faith has grown called democracy. 
Democracy, he said, is a religion. It's called man-pleasing. It has begotten progressivism, a form of socialism. Our own state was the herald of that progressive movement. However, progressivism is not divorced from the churches. All progressivism is, is a heretical Presbyterianism. How did we get this way? Once upon a time in the United States, there was a Presbyterian church that was called the Guardian of the Republic. You've heard me use that phrase. Presbyterianism was so powerful that even though the majority of Americans were not Presbyterian, the salt-like effect of their witness, remember, your influence goes far beyond your church affiliation. Your influence reaches out and has a deep effect. You heard me say last week, and I mean it, you'll hear me say it again. Every Christian, given Christ's words and the definition of tipping point, if that's a valid issue, meaning that a small fact or a small movement or an event can explode into great and exponential results and benefits, or the results, or I mean, excuse me, or the opposite, first. You heard me say it with the hush puppy. The hush puppy's shoe. You heard me show. You heard me this this course in the drop in crime in crime in New York City. The point here is that the Christian is a tipping point, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and hundredfold. There are little things you do, key obediences, that change the world. You might not live to see all that, but when you take a stand for that which is upright, that obedience. Is taken by God into the world and bears fruits that you know you may not ever know anything about until you stand before the Lord. Machen made the point that that is exactly what is happening, except in the opposite sense. Because there is a satanic spiritualism. And they get their 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold. They entered the fray, he says, among the Unitarians turned liberal later on. They entered the fray knowing they were in the minority, the extreme minority, and they entered the fray to win. And in 1923, by that time, they had practically won. The changes they won, they, they wanted, they've gotten, he said. They are apostates, and they have begotten much worse. The analogy? When the demon leaves a person, the man cleans himself up. But then seven more return, and the state of that man is much worse. He never repented. The devil simply left him for a time, and he awkwardly reformed. It appeared there was change. Now, there will be change of a much greater nature as Satan assumes jurisdiction over the person's life, and they become legion. And like the demoniac, the gathering demoniac, we have our serial killers. We have much worse than that, the principalities and authorities. We are losing our children. A generation believes communism is better than freedom. That Joe Stalin was a hero. I heard that at my own dinner table back in 2003. I heard Russians who visited us, friends of glory, which went over to get Alex. They came to visit us. Good people all. That's the problem with this. We're up against good people. Sincere, and they are good people. They were at our dinner table, and I mentioned Joe Stone because his statue was outside that orphanage. They said, well, Joseph, "Joseph Stone was a great, was a great hero." Now you'd expect, I suppose, Russians would understand his brutalities. We pointed out, of course, his brutalities in some of the statistics. I had them, I knew them well enough. And they said, "But you," and they they said it nicely, but they said it. You see, you've been raised in America. And an American must think those things. My reply was, I was raised in America, and I'm free to think as I need to and wish to. You're the one that does not understand freedom of thought, thanks to Joe Stalin. It went right over. He did not understand. These are Christian people who had suffered with KGB in their own congregation. That for another time. But the problem is, we are, it is upon us today. You have to import from Russia. Christian people who have suffered, who declared Joe Stalin to be a hero. He had his warts, granted, as a murderer. But now 
we have them in our own city blocks, in our own homes, imbibing that in the schools. Some questions. If Presbyterianism, and that included, by the way, the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, and the Puritans, they were all pretty much the same government, same kind of governance, ruled by eldership, the pastors. If Presbyterianism was the guardian of the Republic, how was it defeated? The answer? It was defeated by its own people, not by the liberals. Second question, why did the Northern Presbyterian Church, remember they, the church split, North and South, the Civil War did that. Why did the Northern Presbyterian Church cease all heresy trials after 1900? There hasn't been a heresy trial since 1900. The answer? It's wrapped up in the word being judgmental. Why judge on a creed? When in fact there's no creed possible. A creed is a man-made device, we're told. What was the theological strategy of the liberals after 1900? The theological strategy of the liberals after 1900 was to use the Bible to criticize the Bible and teach that all throughout all denominations in America. Machen tried to expose it, Ben Till tried to expose it, Rush Dooney tried to expose it, Francis Schaeffer tried to expose it. Use the Bible to criticize the Bible, and if a person is left with a contradiction, that's just fine as long as they block you, the one trying to teach the truth. If that's a success, then a contradiction is okay in ethic. That continues, you will not have a Bible long as an authority. Why did the Presbyterian Church in the United States abandon its confession, the Westminster, as a means of screening its leadership? Because, the answer, because the vast number of such leaders were in violation and did not believe the Westminster larger and shorter catechisms and the confession of faith by way of poll and survey. The vast number, the vast percentage of them questioned its tenets. Question, what was the importance of seminary education in the liberals' capture of the Presbyterian Church? Use the seminaries to rewrite the ministry, its purpose, its creeds. The key there is to move away from Christian scholarship and have PhDs in other disciplines like psychology, sociology, history, etc. Get away from expertise in the language arts, Hebrew and Greek, etc. Have experts in the pulpit who are experts in psychology, behavioral psychology, sociology, and other areas. Let other disciplines provide the interpretive framework for the church. That was the strategy. What was the theological legacy of Princeton Seminary? The one seminary that stood, that taught some of the great men of the faith, who stood in defense of our republic. To introduce the higher criticism and to defeat men like Robert Dick Wilson, Machen. Drive out men like Van Til and Machen, and they did. The issue was to discipline J. Gresham Machen and split that, the Orthodox, from the Presbyterian Church at work. What was the theological legacy of Union Theological Seminary? If you're going to pass a counterfeit, one wise man said, if you're going to pass a counterfeit bill, you do not put it all in orange and pink and bright letters and put the image of Bob Hope in the center. That's not how you pass a counterfeit. What you want for a counterfeit, counterfeit dollar is to have it as close to a real dollar as possible. The seminary that passed the counterfeits off to all the churches of the Union Theological Seminary. Today it's a Marxist hotbed. That seminary's influence went way beyond the Presbyterian Pale. It poisoned the well of denominations all over throughout America. Why did people who initially talked conservative wind up going along with liberal church leaders? So as not to be the visible. Don't be divisive. Pursue amity and try and win them. 
Why did others who taught Calvinistic wind up going along with liberal church leaders? The answer, because they were ashamed of Calvinism. It was too rigorous. And therefore they compromised themselves. How was a Baptist, John D. Rockefeller, involved in the Presbyterian conflict? John D. Rockefeller Jr. purchased influence in the denominations, all of them. Key individuals sitting in the synods, the general associations, the hierarchies, and by there can neutralize resolve against the progressive movement in particular. Money talks. And as Major pointed out, and my people love to have it so, ultimately, why was it that the people of God surrendered their churches? Major's answer, the day will come when another generation will love the law of the Lord and not be so willing to part with it as the foundation, the interpretive principles and ethics of the people. Right now we are accustomed to a lawless Christianity. Therefore the Lord will judge us. I'd like you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 3, please. Last week we spoke about blessing. There is no discussion in the Bible of blessing unless you handle the flip side, curse. Ezekiel chapter 3, a passage that perhaps more than any other passage in the Bible, but to me personally, God's its implications. Ezekiel chapter 3, you've heard me reference this before, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 3 are also two other passages. I'm not quite sure which one frightens me the most. But because of, and that is not because they are evil, but because I am. It's my sinfulness I'm afraid of. It's my evil that will undo me. It is my sinfulness that ought to scare me. It is not the case that I rest content that Christ is my Savior. It is the case I rest content that He's my Savior with the knowledge that He calls me to repentance. That I not become lax. For if I become lax, God will place a stumbling block before me. And he reserves the right to do so, and that's the frightening part of it. You should notice that the passage speaks in two cases. If, as a watchman on the walls, I make you a watchman, he says, and he's speaking to God's people, if there's a wicked man, and you do not warn that wicked man, then his blood I will require at thine hand. Now, obviously, you're not, you're not responsible for everybody in the phone book. God is a providential God. We are providentialists. God places you in circumstances whereby you can fruitfully bring witness and testimony of his name. Not every day brings a new person into your life. So we're not being silly here in our claims. What we are, however, saying is that if a wicked person is to be judged and you don't warn them, then God will require that blood of your hand. Now, if you do warn them, you've delivered your soul. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness, verse 20, and commits sin, I lay a stumbling block before him. If you warn him, if you do not warn him, excuse me, your blood I'll require in his hand. If you do warn him, and the righteous, now if you warn him in verse 21, so that the righteous sin not, he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he was warned by thee, and you delivered your soul. I want you to understand the great burden that that places on all of us. But first of all, I want you to understand that there are certain words that don't show up in the vocabulary. You can often tell the, uh, the, the message, if you're exposed to a person long enough, there are certain words that don't come up and certain words that do. Words that do not come up in the vocabulary of the churches today are words like apostasy. You won't hear it. You will not hear the word covenant, or rarely. Even the word righteousness you won't hear. You hear about getting saved, and that's good, nothing wrong with that. 
But you don't hear about imputation, because it's not taught. You don't hear justifying faith. You hear about getting saved. You don't hear the word, here's one, heresy. That you don't hear. There is no such thing in the evangelical churches as an heretic. It doesn't exist and it is not taught. Much less is there an alarm. And I would say the same in the reform. We're not much better if we are better at all. Heresy and heretic simply aren't named. Apostate and apostasy. Righteousness. Obviously the word judgment comes and takes a beating. The law of the Lord takes a beating. Predestination, we're ashamed to even bring up. Unless under very cold, very uh, careful conditions and we know we won't get clobbered. We know we'll get clobbered if the democracy weighs against us. Alex de Tocqueville wrote his book, Democracy in America, and in the first part of that book, actually throughout, he said that Americans, the Puritans, laid the foundation. And I want you to understand the principles. You've heard me speak to that, but all I'm going to do today is point to the fact that he noticed that the Puritans laid a foundation that the other colonies watched. They were the guardians, and the Presbyterians took that over. They, congregations of Puritans, were pretty much judged as all Presbyterians, ruled by elders. What the Tocqueville was fearful of is that word, that religion called democracy. It means man-pleasing. More to the point, he explained it, where Americans were principled before in their churches. They were creedal in their churches. They lost the principles by looking to those around for agreement concerning truths. That's a democracy. Once you have the approval of others, then you put the other person back who takes a principled stand. Democracy, he said, is a leveler. America will lose her freedoms because of that religion. It's a man-pleasing religion, and it gulps down, it treads, it rolls over everything in its path. He says, the problem is, the churches, even in this day, are starting to become democratic. Whereas before, they were representative, and they were constitutional. Their people were representative, but they were, well, represented, but they were not it was not a democracy. If, in fact, he says, America gets to the point where the, where the majority defines truth, truth will be gulped down and tyranny will be America's heritage. In Ezekiel chapter 3, the definition of apostasy is set before us without the word. When is something apostate? Well, if God requires the blood of someone and they die in their sins and you had a message that they rejected, the message that they reject, that rejection is apostasy. It results in curse and results in their loss. The problem is the blood can be upon you. I want you to understand how dangerous this is. Go to Romans, if you would, chapter 11. We're getting closer to answering Paul's issue of obedience or disobedience. Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, we know that King David's calling by God was to fight the wars of the Lord. That's often misunderstood, and it's easy to misunderstand that. He was a man of war. Why? Israel spent, well, before his lifetime, during and after, well, not so much after, obviously, the peace of Solomon, but during his lifetime, 40-some years, then prior to him, there was nothing but civil war. There was invasion of Amal uh, there was an invasion by uh, Philistines, multiple invasions, Syrians, Moabites, Edomites, Ammonites, and they had the tyranny of Saul to contend with. They had the banditry of Amalekites and Kenites. They had a disrupted union 
Israel was up for grabs for any bandit, thug, or invader. It was David's job to save Israel and to give her her home among the nations as a union. It was her, it was his job to protect. But he didn't have the time or the strength or the resource to build the temple. Now we know that about David. The problem was, please note, within Israel, at verse 7, in uh, Romans 11 at verse 7, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which she seeks for, but the elect has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes they should not see, and ears they should not hear, unto this day. And David said, please note this. Let their table be made a snare, a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back away. Do you realize what he just said? A blessing given by God is a curse if it's misused. Any blessing given by God becomes a curse upon its abuse. Or, more especially, if it does not, it is not used to give glory to Jesus Christ. Tell two people that were Buddhists that they are married and their marriage is a gift of God but in their idolatry they are abusing that gift is to call them apostates. God gave them the gift of marriage but they are to use the marital relationship to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Well my religion doesn't teach me that. That's not my, that's not the issue. That's not my point. Now you say it as gently and as charitably as you can, but the fact is, marriage is a gift of God. Churches are a gift of God. Here in the church, remember Israel is called the ecclesia of God, the church of God, or synagogues, or churches. They attacked David. They maligned him. They rejected his call for the law of the Lord and the rule of Christ. He said, therefore, let their table, that's their Passover table, be a snare. Instead of that which was, and he says, that which should have been for their benefit is now their condemnation. Turn over to Joshua chapter 11, please. Chapter 7. I am not talking about somebody that's repented. Let's be, let's be clear about our applications. We are all sinful. If a man or a woman, having sinned, live repentantly, in other words, their fruits show a different lifestyle, that's repentance. We walk with them. If not, then what's this? Oh, let's close the doors. Redemption then cannot apply. We're not talking about that. I want you to take a look here in jo Joshua chapter 7. In verse 1, the children of Israel committed a trespass and the accursed thing. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zephi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. They were told not to take the spoil of Jericho. They were forbidden. Achan stole some of it. When they went into the city, he found some loot. He found some probably gold and silver. You know, he found some things. He took it back. He hid it. In fact, he hid it successfully in their tent. Pardon? Under. Yeah, well, yeah, underneath, yeah, underneath, not inside, for some I meant underneath the thing. He hid it underneath their tent, and he covered it over, is the point. Israel is falling in battle. They went from winning at Jericho, they had one on the other side against uh, Og and Sion, Sion and Og, giants. They had crushed them. They cross, the Jordan opens up, they cross over the Ark of the Covenant, they, Jericho falls in front of them, then they go after one little town called Ai. It was hardly a speck, hardly a hamlet, and they're routed. 36 men die. Now, what Joshua and the leaders did not do, they did not relativize the apostasy. They did not say, 
Anything like the falling one. That's what happens in battle. They cried unto God and they said, why are you against us? And God came back with the answer. Look what he says. In verse 11. Israel hath sinned. Let that sink in. Israel hath sinned. I didn't take the stuff and put it underneath my tent. Israel hath sinned. The covenant was broken. The people were chargeable. Then God said, which you will do, you cast lots, because it was so such a fine deceit that cast lots. And up came the the tribe of Judah went random down the families. If you read this, and they find Achan and Joshua comes up to them, and the very thing I tell you not to do with the book of Job is the very thing Joshua did. My son, what have you done wrong? Except this is under divine favor. And Job says, or excuse me, and Achan says, we took it such and such. They were brokenhearted. And God said to put them to death. Take the unclean thing, take him out of my camp, put him to death. That doesn't seem to square with the long suffering of Jehovah, does it? I mean, what chance that he can have? We do have the warning in Hebrews 6 if we sin willfully. After we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. You have no sacrifice at that point for that sin. You'll go on to the sanction. That's why that chapter scares me. If we sin, if we struggle with a sin, we're battling it, that's a different issue. Then we have a trespass offering if we violate it. But if we just wantonly say, I'm doing this, there is no sacrifice for that sin once we, once we perpetuate it. We sin with knowledge, there's no sacrifice for that sin. We go on to judgment. Even, I mean, God is still merciful. It doesn't mean a death sentence. Not everything results in death. However, if it's something that by doing could bring blood upon someone's head, if they were to warn you, and or they were not to warn you, we are now sitting at the door of apostasy. Moses had a covenant. Chapter 3 of Exodus. You don't have to turn there. You know the story. He was said, you will go to the people of Israel, you will call them to repentance, you will tell the elders that to assemble the people, and I will go to Pharaoh. And so he was charged. He and his family were traveling, and he refused to circumcise his son. And he refused. Christ Jesus, the Lord, as a man, went after him to kill him. And he was in desperate straits trying to defend himself. Christ would have killed him. His wife, we know that by the haste with which his wife circumcised the boy and threw the bloody foreskin at his feet and said, you're a bloody man. Apostasy. Bloodshed. She had to hurt her baby son, get him cut, perform the operation, throw it at his feet. That's bloody. It's not supposed to be bloody. And it was. Shows she somewhat martyred her son and was angry with her husband because he was a bloody man. You're acting like an apostate. The blood is on your head. Had we continued, death would have come your way. That's apostasy. And her participation in it then, being a good woman, was in jeopardy. She was in jeopardy. David was in jeopardy by continuing to commune with the people of Israel. They were in a snare. Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I'll bless you then. David did come out from them. Because the covenant had become an offense to God. That's the issue with separation. When the covenant becomes a bloody thing to participate in, you get out. America is a bloody country. She hasn't repented her abortions. She hasn't repented her sins. Remember, if a man is repentant, you forgive and you walk with him. 
You don't curse them. Second Corinthians chapter 2 tells you, if you do continue to curse them, then the blood's on your head. Satan will be handed over, you'll be handed over to the devil. God is redemptive. So what then is the issue? If God is long-suffering on the one hand and redemptive, how then is he judged so quickly in these cases? Moses would have been killed. We need to solve that problem. As one writer put it, evangelicals love the word, and reformed, love the word long-suffering in God. A, he's doing the suffering. B, it's long. And three, we kind of get off the hook 70 times 7. In other words, the view of grace is we can go along and go along and go along and go along. We're not quite sure when too much is too much because then that's when the love doctrine kicks in. God's love. Long-suffering has to be understood in Scripture. Go over to 1, Corinth, uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, please. Let's deal with that issue. First Kings chapter 13. Excuse me, 2 Kings 13. Kings 13, I was right the first time. That's what happens when you can't read your own notes. First Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. At verse 8. For some reason I was looking at verse 18. Verse 8. A young prophet was sent to bear witness against Baal. His instruction was, go to the shrine, condemn it, and go home, and do not stop to eat anywhere. Note, stopping to eat and having communion and fellowship with another person that's of a kindred spirit is normally a good thing. It's hospitality. You are to go there, you are to condemn the Baal's shrine, and you are to leave and go home and not stop anywhere. Well... In verse 8, the man of God said unto the king, Thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread or drink water in this place. The king offered. Come and commune with me. He said, I can't do that. God said no. So now he goes, in verse 11, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. His sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. So he went out and he called the young man. He said, look, I have, I was told by the Lord that you can come and sit down and commune with me. And the young prophet did, and went and sat down with the old prophet. And while they were eating, of course he claimed an angel had spoken unto him. In verse 20, it came to pass as he sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet that had brought him back and cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as you have disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and have not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but you came back and you've eaten bread and drunk water in the place in which the Lord God said, Do not eat bread or drink water. A lion tore him up. He died. The man who had brought him into a covenanted fellowship laid a snare for him in his disobedience. The man went out. He was torn by a lion. It seems to make our problem worse, doesn't it? The old prophet was grieved and came and took the remains of the young prophet and buried him. He was heartbroken, but that doesn't do the, old, the young prophet any good. Yeah, he's honored, but he's disobedient. So how do we manage this long-suffering of God? It's pretty clear that God wants his word kept in all particulars. 
God has built into his word a framework for long suffering. I've often told my children as I raised them, You're, you will be spanked and given the sting of death on the buttocks so that the Lord not judge you more severely. God will be patient if he sees that I'm handling your sins in a more merciful manner. God is long-suffering as long as the covenant head disciplines the child. And I disciplined them, and I actually told them that, that we had family court. The Bible says that he who does not chasten his son hates him. Now, there's plenty of kids out there that Proverbs 30 applies to. They don't have parents who care for them. They will not be disciplined, and they will die in their youth. God's long suffering won't be long, and they will suffer. They'll die in foreign battle because I had a number of good friends that died in Vietnam. Their bodies did not return. They were not given burial because they were dismembered. They were in pieces. One I do know died crying for his mommy, crying that his mother, that he could see his mother one more time. That I do know. He's an acquaintance, not so much a friend, but that's not the point. Proverbs 30 says, that generation out there that is untaught will not receive the long-suffering of God. He won't suffer long with that. But inside the covenant home, the baptism tells us that the parents take the place of God as his vice parents, and they discipline the children. They instruct the children. When the children are wayward, it is the father and the mother who instruct the kids. That's an act of discipline. Spanking on the buttocks is, of course, an act of discipline. We know that in what is it, Proverbs 19, 18? But he who chases his son be times loves his son. But when it comes to the instruction, that's your immersion of the child. And the children are taught, and you young people do understand, and parents understand, that that is the long suffering of God. God will sit back and say, I will see how this, I will see how this takes place. I will see the results in their lives. I will wait to see if repentance and redemption are the proper results. That's the issue. If the parents honor, are honored by the children and the parents honor the children and both come to, be, come to pass despite the sins, there's redemption and the church of Jesus Christ must be preaching redemption. If we don't close the doors. We all sin. It's not so much the past sin, you've heard me say, it's the failure to repent and the failure to redeem. However, God's not a fool. He won't be long and he will not suffer. If the means of his grace are not used, David left to chastise Saul's table, would not eat with him again. The old prophet reproved the young prophet. Why did you disobey? No, he was capable. He was culpable. He grieved. He's the one that misled and laid a stumbling block before him, as the Lord says in Ezekiel, he would do. There's a framework. I'd like you to go in Luke chapter 9. Turn over to Luke. In Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, the Lord tells us, verse 5, Whosoever will not receive you when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. All of us have a testimony to give. God then will decide to be long, either long-suffering or not, based upon what they do. If they reject him, there is a public testimony. You know, we've all heard the Accusation that God, you know, people die without Christ and therefore they've been hurt. This issue of testifying to people is very important. It's happened in Ezekiel, now we have it again. People don't know the truth, you go and you testify to them. If, however, they don't they do they don't accept it. Now their blood's on their own head. That's what that dusting of the sandals means. You turn your back and leave. Their blood's on their own head. If blood on the head means that the mess they have received will cause them, that they refuse to receive, causes them to fall. The manner in which they fall becomes the nature of the curse and its sanctions. In America, as Major pointed out, the Presbyterian Church refused to bring the men who were teaching heresy 
evolution, Darwinism, <coughs> anti-Trinitarianism, higher criticism, refused to bring them. He said that it will be the case because it's a long-standing problem. We will lose our faith because we have a Bible being used to criticize itself and no one takes it to heart. The contradictions linger. Doubt grows. We have become ensnared inside of a covenant that will not, that has no immune system. And therefore, because no one will raise the specter of a church court, because it's so ugly, the church having no immune system will die in it. First Corinthians chapter 11. For this cause, well, look, let's get the predecessor, the predecessor verse. Is there not one wise man among you that can handle these things? Paul writes, a wise man is no. For this cause, because you do this, you eat and you drink, you're not charitable, you eat and drink, even under drunkenness in your church feast. For this cause, some among you, many among you are sick and some sleep. They didn't take the means of God's long suffering. There should have been someone to go and contest that turf. Stop the drunken. You don't show up as a drunken church. And when it comes to the poor, when they come to the door, we feed them. We help them. Where did the church become the snob that has it all and others that look to us? Or perhaps it's class structure in the church. Some have, others don't. In this I praise you not, Paul says. God's long suffering. When Peter and Barnabas listened to the dissimulation of those that said Jews and Gentiles in the church to separate out, Paul made a trip there immediately. Why? Well, he was doing dealing with the Galatians. In that book, he uses that example, chapter one, having it announced an anathema. On the Galatians. You're substituting the gospel. He then uses chapter 2 as his example. He went and he said, And I confronted Peter to his face because he was to be blamed. When there is Matthew 18, when there is church court, for example, the Presbyterian level, heresy, I believe Reformation in your day will mean you will hear of heresy trials. I haven't heard of one in 30 years. There was one at Westminster when I was going there. And it had just, it was just finishing. That heresy trial tore everything apart, ripped everybody, everybody was gutted and bleeding. As a result, the man who taught me the higher criticism by embracing it in class got away with it because he knew very well no one, knew, no one wanted a church court. Dr. Ray Dillard had no problem whatsoever in teaching the higher criticism in class and denying inerrancy in class. It was left to a kid, me, to have to contest him in class. And how arrogant is that, that a young student's got to, and went all the way to the top of the president's office. That's unfair. And I did not get my degree because I couldn't get past the chairman of the Old Testament Department, Dr. Ray Dillon. That's unfair. The fact of the matter is, he knew very well that there was, as he put it, there was heresy in the air. Nobody wanted to deal with it anymore. Too disruptive. Matthew 18 tells us the word is nephepo. You go and you confront. You do so as charitably as possible, but you confront. Second step is witnesses. Third step is church court. There's a lot that happens in between to try and redeem it. This is not some formula that you just go through. People's lives are at stake. But as Machen pointed out, the church has an immune system, and God is long-suffering. As long as in the long-suffering, we step up to the plate. The people at Corinth were in jeopardy because there was no wise man to judge. So their participation in the covenant was dangerous. 
David was in danger as he sat with table, at, at table with those that were a snare. He left it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the man that had been, they had not judged, comes back and he's bleeding inside. He's crying for forgiveness and the church at Corinth refused to bring him back in. And Paul says, you want your communion to be again in danger? You were in danger for not dealing with his sin. Now you're in danger for not redeeming him. You want Satan to be your portion again? Bring him back in. And they brought him back in. We don't have an immune system in the Church of Christ. And we are greatly in danger, and we are fleeing from before the adversaries. That doesn't mean anything to the churches. Dominion itself, when brought up as a theology three decades ago, took a beating publicly. The very word took a beating. To use the word dominion today is to get you in trouble in any church Presbyterian examination. Were I to use the term dominion in front of, in front of a Presbyterian examination committee, they would immediately jump on it because they do. I witnessed it in another case. Dominion is made out to be this proud, arrogant attack. Some sort of dirty thing. When we flee before our enemies, when the church fails in front of our enemies, it's not because modernism is too strong, it's because we are too sinful. We are made a supernatural people, and there's not media, politicians, parties, ideologies, I don't care what they are. None of them are designed to be more powerful than the Christian church. It's we, ourselves, and us who are the enemy of righteousness all too often. We don't have an immune system. We judge all to be egalitarian. All churches are the same. No, they're not. I'm not here to try and convince you that ours is the best in the church around. I'm not at all going to say that. I am going to say that we better be faithful to the truth and testify where we can instead of having them make us flee when we know we've got these truths. We are called to confront sin. We are called to redeem. Inside the home, there is discipline. There is a discipline and a united front of mom and dad. Nothing like the following ever occurs in your home, I'll, I'll wager. You come home after a hard day, the wife comes to you and says, she or he, the child, Jack, I'll make one up. Jack is disobedient. Well, then there's division the over that. No, there's a united front. Why can't the church take a stand like that against evil? Because she doesn't have the standard judicially to do that. The Apostle Paul was charged at the outset of his apostolic ministry. You will stand before kings. He took 30 years of ministry to lay the foundations of the church. He was a Nazarite, and he had by the law of the Lord to offer the Nazarite vow at Jerusalem. He waited until the end of his ministry. By the law of the Lord, he was compelled to go irrespective of anyone else or anything else. If he did not testify against the rulers of his people who represented his people, Their blood was on his head. I'm a Jew of the Jew. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I would give if necessary. Please note this. Note the importance of the passage. I would give everything for my brethren. He loved them so deeply. Giving everything for his brethren was to go to Jerusalem and testify to their covenant heads that they were in jeopardy by the prophets themselves. That continuation in their covenants was dangerous. They had killed the Lord Jesus. They were killing the churches and persecuting us. They're contrary to all men, Paul said. 
He had to testify to the leaders of that covenant. We have a representative form of government. They represent us before God. They're not just the Democratic or the Republican parties. They are to represent us. How are they doing? They represent you. That means that you and I participate in their judgment unless we stand opposed to them. That doesn't mean we become Billy Graham and attract millions. No, we don't get on the internet and cry out on Facebook. So I'm not saying that. No, it follies. But we have to stand against them by way of testimony. They are representative heads. They're not Democrats, they're not Republicans, they are representatives. That's a federal system. And the bottom line is that judicially, we are responsible for their actions. We're responsible for our president. We're representing them. We're responsible for our state legislatures. We're responsible for our governors. That's the system God gave us. It's a covenant. We cannot have covenants that have no immune system. God then will judge us. I realize that this is not <clears throat> God. If you look in Luke, you'll see at the very end of the chapter, as we close, in Luke 9, man comes to him and says, let me suffer first, uh, suffer me first, go and bury my father. And Jesus says that which appears to be most callous. Let the dead bury their dead. Come and follow me. In other words, if you're going to act in a way that something as important as burying your father is more important than bearing witness against the wicked and teaching the kingdom of God, going out and teaching the kingdom, then you are ensnared and their blood is on your head. Let the dead bury their dead, if that's what it needs to be. The other fellow said, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell to them that are at my house. And Jesus said, no man. Having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The church, the Puritans came over, they put their hand to the plow, their children did not finish the furrows. They went to build a tower, and they said, it's too costly. Come down to our generation, we will not finish the task. That is the reason De Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America. Read them. The children of the fathers refused to finish the task. They become like the European churches, like the church in my, in my country, in France. They are not, they're no longer being distinguished for their stand in principle. That's what made America great. Her churches in principle. Nothing else did. It wasn't our freedoms. It wasn't our Statue of Liberty. There have to be some that are tough in principle for us to have the blessings that spread throughout the earth. We have to have the courage to take a stand in principle. And when people see that there's a stand in principle, they suspect, in fact, that it's of the Lord. And then they find that there is no contradiction in the Bible because you will not allow the blockage. You will not allow the contradiction to stand. You say yea, they say nay. Okay, let's sit down and wrestle this together. But if we both are right, there's a contradiction in the Bible and that cannot be right. The Bible stands as the Word of God. And so we seek to Reconcile its truths. That's what we don't do. And sometimes we have to do that with our very lives. When we take a stand like that, God is long-suffering. The framework for long-suffering is your faithfulness to testify. And mine. If you let God let go... As the phrase goes, God will not prove himself to be long-suffering. You can't let go and let God. It doesn't work that way. He's called his sons to represent him. And so it was with Paul. And Paul, if necessary, would go to the death. He himself said as we close, 
I would that I myself were cut off from my brethren after the flesh. He would even be cut off if he could have saved his brethren, the Jews. It's on that basis that Paul went to his death. He testified of the truth. Because when Israel stands compromised without repentance, Israel hath sinned. And they fall before the enemies of righteousness. Those who stand are the blessed of God. Even if it means a cross. Let's pray. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, the democracy is nothing more than a count of heads, the pressure of which changes the nature of a principle to acceptable or prohibitive based upon the vote instead of based upon the precept. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you please that your mercy would be extended to us, that men and women would stand if necessary alone. These are hard truths. But these truths stand from the scriptures themselves. You look for a man to stand in the gap for the land, you say. You look for a watchman to testify against the wicked, that his blood be not upon our heads, if we warn him. And for a righteous man, if you put a stumbling block in front of him, that we warn the righteous man, and he be spared, and he's delivered, and we're delivered. O oh Lord, in our God, the passage addresses both. How many upright, righteous men and women do we know before whom are laid stumbling blocks that we must call to repentance? How many are there? Lord, if they are good, and so many are, will the stumbling block catch them? Will the table that is a snare trap them? The churches flee before their enemies. It is given to the media. It is given to the philosophers, the educators, the public schools, the politicians, and the judges to be strong against the church because the church has compromised her walk. I ask you, Father, for the sake of your Son, that you will hear our prayer. And blessed is he who is not ashamed of thee. We ask this in Christ's name.